Good evening and welcome to Conversations with the Candidates, sponsored by Houston Media Source TV and the League of Women's Voters Houston area. I'm Jessica Wiggins and on tonight's broadcast we have Democratic candidate Rodney Ellis running for Harris County Commissioner Precinct 1. We're going to ask you some questions today to learn a little bit more about you and your positions on issues affecting a precinct and Harris County. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Um, and on behalf of the League of Women's Voters, let's get started. Well, Jessica, thank you. I uh, have always enjoyed working and watching the League of Women Voters over the years. I mean, since the early 1900s, they've always been there working both sides of the aisle. All of us have tremendous respect for them and the work that they do and for that great voters guide that not only uh, helps me figure out uh, how I'm going to vote, but it educates the public on issues and on people who are running. So thank you for having me. Thank you. So tell us about yourself and why you're running for Harris County Commissioner Precinct 1. Well, I'm a native Houstonian, grew up on the south side, sunny side, got involved in politics at an early age, student council president back at Worthing High School, then went off to college in New Orleans for a year, and then graduated at Texas Southern, came back home, then went to Austin to the LBJ School, University of Texas Law School, interned around the state capitol uh, while I was in uh, graduate school and uh, then uh, got a great job offer to go to Washington, D.C., be chief of staff of uh, Congressman Mickey Leland in his second term. And then uh, with his support, I ran for the Houston City Council. Hmm. I did three terms, six years on the Houston City Council during an exciting time. Lee Brown was police chief in Houston. Kathy Whitmire, first female to be elected mayor of Houston, was in office. Oh, wow. And then when uh, Congressman Leland died in a tragic plane crash 30 years ago, then State Senator Craig Washington moved up to Congress. I ran for the State Senate. I served in the State Senate for 26 years. And when Commissioner L. Franco Lee died suddenly, mm -hmm. I made the decision to throw my hat in the ring to become a Harris County Commissioner. I've been here three years. And I uh, had a long record in the State Senate of fighting for progressive issues mm -hmm. over a long period of time. 700 bills that crossed the gamut. Virtually everything you can think of that impacted the quality of life for working class people. Uh, and now for my three years on um, commissioner's court, I've been fighting that fight as well. Uh, I went there and I was the only Democrat, only person of color. A year later, things changed. Uh, Lynn Hidalgo became county judge. Adrian Garcia became a county commissioner. Right. It's been a sea change and it's been a whirlwind of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm interested in public service because it's been my life. From student council president, it's all that I focus on. And I think I've had uh, a number of successes along the way that I think people can uh, learn about uh, and I think will support me. At least I hope they will. I'm gonna do my best to earn that support. And you mentioned working class people. Would you say that working class people are your focus in, in your campaign and in your uh, tenure as in your position? Throughout my career, the focus has been on trying to bridge, bridge that divide, that gap, that inequality index, if you will, that we have. In a lot of ways, it's because the neighborhood I came out of has such uh, an interesting history that is in many ways uh, symbolic of the struggle uh, that working class people still yeah. have today. Sunnyside was a segregated uh, black township, for lack of a better way of describing it, mm -hmm. right outside the city of Houston, established during the era of racial terror. In fact, they had a segregated Sunnyside uh, County Negro School District for blacks to go to mm. elementary school until they went to high school. Then they had a, in a local with Jack Yates High School to transfer in. Oh, wow. And there were issues of neglect, you know, environmental racism issues in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. My first protest was with my mom, trying to close a dump site, old Sunnyside dump site. And I think that in a lot of ways really helped shape my philosophy on issues. And when I went on city council, I fought to get the city to create a minority business enterprise policy. Mm -hmm. So minority and women-owned businesses could participate mm -hmm. in programs doing business with the city. Yeah. Garbage workers had a strike. I got in the middle of that and settled that issue. Went to the state senate, 
I'm proud of the Texas Grants Program. It's the largest state-funded free tuition program uh, in America. New York just passed one about a year ago, comparable to it. It'll be bigger over time, but right now in Texas, that scholarship program, Texas Grants, is giving about $5 billion. Um, hate crimes legislation was a big battle. It took a decade to pass that bill to make sure that we could enhance the penalties if someone committed a crime hmm. based on somebody's race, religion, or sexual orientation. Uh, but I fought for civil rights issues all my life. So I say working class sometimes, uh, but really focusing on issues to uplift minorities and women and working class people, families in general, that need access to, uh, to health care. And at Commissioner's Court, I've continued that battle, focusing on equity issues, whether it's criminal justice reform, that historic bail uh, settlement that we did for misdemeanor bail was the first step. In the state senate, I pushed Harris County to create a public defender's office. We didn't have one. We still had that old school system where the judges would pick the lawyers to represent someone accused of a crime. When I left the senate and came to commissioner's court, after fighting to get that office created, I found out that the public defender's office was only handling 10% of the cases. Now with this new uh, progressive mindset on commissioner's court, we have tripled the percentage of cases that the public defender's office will handle. It ought to get to about 30% by the end of this year. Then we're pushing something called managed assigned counsel. Get away from the judge picking the lawyer for someone accused of a crime. That's just an inherent conflict of interest. The bail settlement, as I mentioned, is a big deal. Uh, a very well-respected Republican federal judge ruled that at least there were 20,000 constitutional violations per year in Harris County people who were locked up, detained, because they didn't have money. That's essentially Sandra Bland over in Walla County. Yeah. She didn't have $500 uh, when she got a $5,000 bail. But equity, in terms of how we divvy up transportation dollars, mm -hmm. focusing not just on neighborhoods that are wealthy, but neighborhoods that are poor, looking outside the box. Transportation ought not just be more impervious cover, where we remembered for the widest freeway uh, in North America, but focus on bike lanes, pedestrian paths, mass transit, uh, what we can do to get more of us out of cars. Resilience is the big issue right now. Right. After Harvey, eight months after I got into office, really a lot of uh, the issues that I thought I would focus on changed. That's the nature of government. You have to be nimble enough to adjust to what happens. So we decided that the county would put some of its money up to try and make up for historic neglect as it, as it relates to issues involving flooding. So that package got up to about $2.5 billion from my office. We let that effort to make it big enough so we could hit Greens Bayou and Halls Bayou Brays, which would have a big challenge meeting the threshold for federal funding, where they would focus on a cost-benefit ratio. That means you do the wealthy in neighborhoods first. I'm just giving you some sense of the world yeah, of ideas. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you kind of hit on it, where transportation and resiliency um, and natural disasters all kind of come come together. So, can you talk more about how important uh, transportation is to your precinct? Transportation is important to my precinct and whole region. Uh, this precinct is very urban that I represent. Precinct 1 is about a million, mm -hmm. 1.1 million people. They are the largest, second largest districts in the country, only being a Los Angeles supervisor, a Los Angeles County Commissioner, which you have more people. LA County, 10 million people, and a five-person governing board split up five, five districts of precincts, two million each. So with us, I'm in a city. All of the universities other than Houston Baptist are in Precinct mm -hmm. 1. So that means you have a, a large in a city population, 30% unincorporated. Some are unincorporated is not covered by Metro, so we got challenges with that. But look, transportation uh, is right up there near the top in terms of issues. If you don't have access to transportation, you cannot get to a job. If you cannot get to a job, you can't get out of poverty. If you don't have access to transportation, you can't get to training, to education. I mean, you just locked in, and those are barriers that create this institutional poverty that we have. So what I'm focusing on is how we can look at all modes of transportation, mm -hmm. not just a car. I mean, you think about Harris County, Houston, you think about the largest, the widest freeway in North America. At one point, the largest one and the widest one in the world was here uh, in Houston. 
And obviously, every time you do a toll road, a freeway, or a street, that is impervious cover. The water has to have somewhere to go. We are sea level. Right. And, uh, so we're trying to think outside the box about what you do about it. Right. And on the topic of impervious cover, everyone in Harris County and I think beyond wants to know, what are your plans for addressing flooding? First thing we did after Harvey was agree that $2.5 billion bond package. Then we went to Washington to make the case. Great support, bipartisan support from our congressional delegation mm -hmm. to get a record amount of money uh, designated for this region after Harvey. Worst natural disaster uh, that we have had in our region. And then, what, what, in that package that you said you took to D.C., what, what was included in that package? Housing uh, as well as flood mitigation projects. Okay. And we wanted a separate designation so Houston and Harris County would not have to go through the state and have to go through their process, which is important because they would be liable. Uh, we didn't get the independent designation. Mm -hmm. So that means even after the battle to get money, we didn't get as much as our friends in New Orleans got after Katrina. Okay. We didn't get as much as the East Coast got uh, after Sandy. But we did get more than we've ever gotten in the history of this region. But comparing it to those other two natural disasters, it was not as much. Remember, we had to compete with the issues in Puerto Rico, fires in California, competing with our friends in Florida as well. But with that said, it would have been better if we'd gotten an independent designation, but we didn't. So that means then we go through the process with the state, and they have to put their rules in place. But with all of that said, at the end of the day, we're all partners. Help is on the way. Mm -hmm. It's always slow getting that money. It's right. going to take time. Uh, it's n still not quite enough. Uh, in addition to the, the federal support, let's just round it off, say that at least a billion plus mm -hmm. in new money to the county, a billion plus in new money uh, to the city. The city has its drainage fee. The county will spend $2.5 billion. There were estimates ranging as high as $10 billion, $30 billion that we ought to spend on infrastructure in this region. Not even getting to the issue of at some point, should we go to the voters and ask for some of our own money to put into housing issues? Hmm. Uh, but with that said, we did raise our standards for new construction right. or rehab. And they're the strictest ones in the state. Uh, I've been told by a county engineer, the strongest ones in the country. Some of my friends in Miami, Dade County, when I used that factoid, they challenged me on it, on it. I brought it back to our county engineer. But it's going to cost more money yeah. to build and rebuild. But here's the issue. You pay for it now or you pay for it later. Right. What we're trying to do is catch up for uh, ignoring problems for decades. Mm -hmm. Decades of essential neglect, but it caught us. Look, I think climate change is real. And when I go out to community meetings and people ask, is there a likelihood that that could happen again? I hope not. I pray not. But it is a possibility. And we're lucky that Harvey was a rain event. If it had been a rain event and a hurricane event, it would have been even worse. But because climate change is a reality now, and I think most people who, have, who even hate to use the phrase realize that something we as human beings have done is contributing uh, to these very weird uh, weather events, mm -hmm. and we got to adjust to it. Right, right. We did put some equity language on the ballot. I let that effort. Uh, I used the leverage that I felt I had because I assume that most people would think it was precinct one that normally would lead the way to vote for a tax increase in order to do something about flooding. And I want to make sure that those neighborhoods that historically were neglected, that didn't just flood with Harvey, that neighborhoods that flood every time, not just as a rain event, they flood when there's a shower. And that equity language is going to give us a chance to go in and complete braze, uh, halls by you and greens by you. The way it works, the city handles drainage issues in the city limits mm -hmm. of getting the water to the bayous, the watersheds that the county flood control district controls. If you unincorporate it, the county is in charge of both. Uh, but we work hand in hand. I think there's more intergovernmental cooperation now between the county and the city than I've ever seen. It's always been emerging. Uh, to the extent that we all have no money complexes, you know, we got to start looking at a more regional approach on things that we do. Uh, I'm spending money on streets, as an example, in right. the city. Right. 
around places where I, I think I can justify it. First of all, looking with the equity lens and also places where we all go, whether you live unincorporated or in the city, Texas Southern, University of Houston, we call it University Corridor Project. There's a historic high school, Jack Yates is over there in between the two. Right. About $30 million, we're gonna make all of them complete streets. When we say complete streets, we mean it. Unless it's just somewhere where it just doesn't make any sense to go in and put a pedestrian path or bike lane, we don't do it. But when it does make sense, we do it. And what is a complete street? Complete street means you take into account all of the users. You take into account if people want to walk along that street, if they want to ride a bike down that street, if they want to get in a car, if you need mass transit, if you need wheelchairs. You know, many of our streets are not ADA accessible. Even my sidewalks aren't. And in addition to streets, we're going in, we're putting together a comprehensive program to go and do some mapping uh, and put sidewalks in areas where we can afford it. Going back to Sunnyside. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I grew up, it was the Shell Street. They put this black stuff on it, not black topping, just some kind of oil so the pollution wouldn't be so bad on us every once in a while. The ditches are still there. When the city took it in, incorporated it many years ago, although people were paying taxes, they didn't get the services. Hmm. Uh, and I want to do as much as we can to make up for historic neglect. On the north side, the south side, the west side, the east side. You know, when I go out to unincorporated, Harris County in particular, it's just interesting to me when I see some of the poverty that for my many years in the state senate, I knew about, but I was not fully cognizant that we have our version of colonials. Right. As we used to refer to it, right here in Harris County. Yes. And when the census comes out, it's going to show Jessica, that there are more people in unincorporated Harris County than in the city of Houston. I'm not talking about Pasadena or other independent home rule cities in the county. Unincorporated, where the legislature gives us very limited ordinance making power. And I'm going to uh, harken back to my years in the legislature to make the case that I didn't understand it when I was there. But in limited areas, we got to give Harris County more power to, to regulate things. You've seen some of the press coverage about the uh, environmental sites, mm -hmm. hazards, yeah. uh, you know, cancer clusters. Super fun. Super fun issues Ship in the, the city limits and outside the city limits. Right. And I'm going to go and make the case that you ought to give us in local government, the county and the city, more power uh, over dealing with those disasters. Right. Right. And so you mentioned um, you're in a, in a place where you have some leverage on um, Commissioner's Court right now with Lena Hidalgo and now Adrian Garcia. What uh, specific policies or issues are you feeling like you can really pursue and accomplish now with the momentum of the court? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Democrats did take over the county uh, and it was a confluence of factors, you know, some anger over national issues, the White House, uh, and Beto O'Rourke, giving mm -hmm. him credit, ran a superb campaign and raised an unprecedented amount of money, about $80 million, and spent a good part of it in Harris County. And we were lucky to have two very unique candidates. Uh, Lena Hidalgo, brilliant person, out of folks I've met in politics, better educated, you know, admitted to what I consider three Ivy League schools, you know, Stanford, uh, NYU, and Harvard very bright, numbers-oriented person, you know, a very interesting background, having been born in Columbia and came here in search of a better life as a young kid with her family. Uh, and she had the tenacity, the chutzpah, if you will, to get out there and run. Bilingual, ran a great campaign. Adrian Garcia, uh, people knew him over the years, uh, former police officer, knew his beat, became a, a city council member and then a sheriff for a number of years. But also Democrats with a progressive pattern. Mm -hmm. When I was there uh, as the only D, I raised the salaries for all of my employees so everybody made at least $15 an hour. Since the uh, new crew came in to take over Commissioner's Court, we've raised it for everybody. We put in worker protections. Yeah. If you're going to get some of that money from disaster recovery uh, effort, you're going to pay all your employees a minimum wage. You're going to have some training. You're going to do uh, worker safety. We're going to be transparent about it. Uh, and we're going to try and see if we can expand that under the law to cover all people who do business with the county. We're going to have a program, the county didn't have one, for minority and women-owned businesses. That's equity. We need to bring more people into this. county spends about $5.2 billion a year. 
In fact, we decided we'd go and make the case to Metro and the port as well, uh, where we give some funding uh, and we also have people on the board. So all three are going to do this thing called a disparity study. First, you have to show that there's the capacity in the minority and women's business community to do the work. Mm -hmm. And then you can design a program to bring them in. We all know that for so long it was an insider game. It was not only who you know, who you knew, it was what you looked like. Right. It was who you were mm -hmm. ter that ter determined whether or not you got to be uh, successful uh, in business. But across the board, we uh, amended our personnel policy to make sure that people cannot be discriminated against uh, because of who they love. Uh, we focused on environmental, is environmental issues being very uh, tight grip in terms of inspections to see what we can do under the current law to make sure people are complying with the law. We created a new department focused on equity and economic development. We did spell out what we mean by equity in that bond package. So we get to those poor neighborhoods first in terms of how we distribute money for transportation projects. We decided we're just going to be fair and split it evenly between all four commissioner precincts until we determine what equity means. We put in some environmental standards on how you use that transportation money. We're going to look at issues like doing more sidewalks. We're doing a countywide assessment of all of the roads, driving all of them so we can see if there are areas that have been historically neglected so we can put more of that money on those streets as opposed to somebody who makes the most noise or has the most clout or lives in the most affluent neighborhood and you can get a commissioner to go and do your streets first. Right. And then that criminal justice space. Mm -hmm. When the new judges got in, uh, the county had spent $10 million fighting this misdemeanor bail lawsuit, an abusive system that clearly had racial overtones. It was unfair. Uh, it didn't make us any safer to only keep people in who didn't have money mm -hmm. and let people out who did have money. If you have money, you're more apt to be a flight risk anyway. First of all, you can buy a ticket to get out of here. If you don't have money, you can't do that. Well, when the new judges won, they adopted a rule that really was the template for us coming up with a comprehensive settlement. Uh, and we will have a monitor over seven years. If there's a need to make changes along the way, either side can go back to the federal court and do that. We created a new justice administration department. Hmm. So instead of just thinking about it the old school way, counties around the country are now looking to Harris County in terms of what we are doing in the criminal justice space. And there's room for a lot more. Uh, but that misdemeanor bail settlement was historic uh, and, it, and, and, and it was big. But across the board, uh, we created a, a new office of research. You know, prior to my coming, I don't think anybody at the Commissioner's Court had a policy department. It was just focusing on parks and roads, which are important. Mm -hmm. But it's an urban area, 5 million people, almost 5 million people. Harris County essentially has a population of the state of Louisiana. More people than you have in Arkansas. More people than in, than in Oklahoma. More people than in uh, New Mexico, each one individually, not collectively. So in a massive urban area like this, what has been so much neglect for so many years, you got to do something about it. Healthcare. We're in charge of healthcare for the indigent. Mm. About half of it. A lot of people think it's about 90%, but it's about half of it. So we're making sure that we're being more numbers oriented. We required our health department to do a health assessment. Uh, we're going to go out and make the case so people understand it. Something's wrong when the zip code you live in has an uh, impact on how long you are expected to live because of the quality of the air one breathes, the quality of the food that you eat. Um, right. My office led the case to create a healthy food financing program. Mm -hmm. You got food deserts all over this massive region, uh, larger than New York City, by the way, my precinct uh, alone, just this precinct in terms of land mass, not population, land mass. It's massive. And you have these deserts where people just don't have access to, def to decent food. So we're going to uh, put out RFPs, spend about $2 million. It's a good step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to our friends at the city, hoping that they'll do something comparable to that as well. So in addition to having mm -hmm. to prepare for the next natural disaster, right? and one could come at any time, my blood pressure is up quite a bit during hurricane season. So is the judges, right? Uh, Judge Hidalgo, because she's on the front line as the first responder that has to make decisions that impact all of us. But look, right. it's been a whirlwind. Uh, for the right. uh, 13 months 
that uh, Judge Hidalgo and Commissioner Garcia and I have been there, and, and we're trying to do as much as we can working with our other colleagues, the issues where we agree, some where we disagree. But we, don't, we want to do as much as we can to change the focus in Harris County. So we're focusing on doing something about that inequality index. Right. Affordable housing is a big problem. Right. And we can't just keep concentrating all of it in Precinct 1. The one that I represent. And I wonder how uh, you balance, you know, uh, the new building requirements that are coming along with natural disasters. Um, does that make building affordable housing harder? Um, and if so, how do you how do you address that? It, it does make the building requirements do make building anything affordable or uh, unaffordable housing uh, more expensive. But you have to do it. Right. It's a real simple issue of you pay now, you pay later. Going back to your transportation question earlier, a study just came out, I think, by Central Houston that basically shows we can't get enough roads to just road build our way out of the transportation morass. Mm -hmm. That impacts, uh, you know, flooding as well, by the way, because every time you build a road or a complex, a housing, anything, a building, you got flooding issues related to it. Right. So we got to get more, some people out of cars. Yeah. We got to change our paradigm. We need a paradigm shift so more of us will get on rail, get on the bus, mm -hmm. carpool, get on a bike, walk. I mean, the number one cause of death is what we'll eat for dinner tonight or breakfast or lunch tomorrow. So we got to do something to combat obesity. And we got to educate people. Right. You know, a group came in to challenge us to a 30 day veg out program, 30 vegetables during the month of March. I'm trying. I'm a little tacky on my record keeping, but, uh, but you know, it's a holistic approach. Right. Uh, you know, it's an exciting time to be in, in government. Uh, we're focusing on what we can do, although the state won't draw down the Obamacare money. Mm -hmm. If the state won't take it, what can we do on our level to do more to get people to sign up uh, and try and impact the politics? These right. mega voting centers, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? People are learning. It's a heck of a lot easier. If you want to vote, you can go to any one of those voting centers. Right. Democrat or Republican, you got to vote. But it does cost more money. And yes. that was the premise behind your additional, your uh, initial question. Yes, it will cost more money to build affordable housing. And that's the sacrifice we're wise to make now. Mm. Because the areas that were devastated the worst in terms of the potential loss of life were those areas where uh, people were in affordable housing, apartment complexes on Greens Bayou, uh, along Halls Bayou, and no way to get out. Uh, so we got to focus on it all. Right. Thank you. Um, so what do you think are some of the other important uh, issues that you'll address in commissioner's court? Um, and I, I want to bring up the um, recent vote to fire the county budget officer. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we're going to have a host of issues uh, involving money going forward. The budget director is a personal friend. He, he did a good job over the years. I think with a change in philosophy, uh, he didn't have the confidence of this governing board. There are a lot of people who've been with the county for a very long time, done a really good job. And we're going to do as much as we can uh, to reward them for being loyal, being there. But we're also bringing in new faces, mm -hmm. uh, new visions. You know, I don't see any others on the horizon who will change. But sometimes when you have a change in leadership, I think it's a good thing to give people who've been left out of the process an opportunity to come in and be involved. And I think that Mr. Jackson is going to do a great job in terms of, a tradition, of, of transitioning uh, to whatever is next uh, for him in life. He has a, a lot of good people in the department who come up through the ranks that we have a lot of confidence in. But I think that happens all the time. When an administration changes in Washington, D.C. on the state level, that's common. It's not the end of the world. We're lucky to have so many bright people out there uh, in Harris County and around the country who are excited about coming here and being a part of the new Harris County. Right. Um, and finally, uh, why are you the best candidate? Um, and how can voters learn more about your campaign? Well, I'm tested. I got a track record. Uh, you can look at what I've done uh, for six years as a council member, 26 years in the state Senate, the three years I've been here on Commissioner's Court. There's a clear track record of fighting for progressive issues. So I'm asking your viewers 
to vote for Rodney Ellis. You can go to RodneyEllis.com, learn all you want to learn about me. You've watched me over the years. I'm the same Rodney now that I was when I got started. I think that we've come a long way. Uh, it's not really just my name on the ballot. The real issue in my race is, are we going to continue to move forward? Or are we going to go back to the way things used to be? I'd appreciate your support. And I appreciate you having me here. And I thank the League of Women Voters for what they do. Thank you for coming out tonight to Houston Media Source and answering our questions so that we all can become more educated voters. Thank you. Um, to let our viewers know, Super Tuesday primary election is next Tuesday, March 3rd, and Metro is providing free rides to the polls on election day, so make sure you get out there and take advantage of that. You'll find more information by going to www.ridemetro.org or calling 713-635-4000. If you'd like to more, learn more about the League of Women's Voters of Houston, our voter's guide has come out in paper. It looks just like this. Um, you'll find more information by going to lwvhouston.org. You can also visit the League's vote411.org website for more information. And to wrap up, this is our final conversation for the candidate show before primary election. Uh, but we'll be back with our public affairs, public access show on Thursday, March 6th at 6.30 p.m. We'll see you then and have a good night. Thank you.